Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. A $121 billion state budget, up 7.9% over last year and only one day late. A new school aid formula and increased education funding, slowing of Medicaid spending, property tax rebates, three men in a room, plus three more. Spending plans literally hot off the presses, voted on in the middle of the night. Ah, Albany. To shed some light on New York State's still Byzantine and opaque budget process and to assess the substance of the state budget, as well as look at the city's budget and long-term fiscal issues, is Diana Fortuna, the president of the Citizens Budget Commission, and I might add a true civic resource. Diana, welcome. Thank you, Doug. Let's start with the state budget process, go to substance, and then turn to the city. Governor Spitzer gives himself a hundred on for his first budget. Now it seems like either great inflation or hallucination. What's your take generally on what transpired in the budget process? Well, it's a funny uh, it's a funny year in a lot of ways. I think you could say that there's uh, how did he do against the expectations that everyone mm -hmm. had for him, and then there's how did he do. Uh, you listed a, a, a nice uh, tally of some important achievements, uh, a new education aid formula and one that, from what we can tell, broke this ridiculous system of shares where uh, even though on paper they have a formula that says who are the neediest kids, mm -hmm. all they do in the end is sit down and say, okay, you, you always get this percentage of the money, you district, so you get that, and New York City gets that, and it's a ridiculous system. So he broke that. Not as sharply, maybe, as one would wish, but he broke that. He got some cuts in Medicaid. So I think there are real important achievements in this budget. Uh, it's less, I think, than, certainly less than what he proposed in his own budget, and not surprising that there are compromises to be made uh, by a governor off of what he proposed. Um, I think the expectations for this were super high, and some of that came from the governor himself. Um, and so I think compared to expectations, there's a bit of a feeling of a letdown. Uh, but I'm ready for to talk about year two. And we'll do that. Being one of the cynics who said it wouldn't change on day one or week one or month one or year one or the first term, there was this sense of disappointment because the expectations were so high. And it looked like the governor was really going to go to it. And about a week before the end came, it, it looked like the whole situation changed. And then getting it out on time became paramount. And then we slipped into, you know, the deja vu all over again. Well, I'm, I am professionally an idealist and have to believe that, you know, you tilt at windmills and you actually win. So I was also very optimistic. Um, you know, the late budget thing, obviously it's important to have a budget on time, uh, but uh, certainly a, a good budget is, is, is better than a, a bad budget that's on time. That said, I think it's hard for any of us to sort of look in our crystal ball and say, oh, I know if I had been in his chair, if I had held out and shut down the government for three weeks, I would have gotten, you know, the following uh, concessions in exchange. So, it, you know, it's hard for me to go there. I think they did, you know, they, it had to have been complicated to sitting in their seat and saying, do we really want to shut this down? Do we really, what would that mean? And so it's not for me to say, I wish they had. There seems to be a feeling of, of disappointment among the reform community, mm -hmm. whether it's your organization or Citizens Union or the League or Common Cause. Right. Again, looking at particularly the process, yeah. and we'll separate process from substance, the process seemed, as I, as I said, as Byzantine and opaque as any. They, they announced this big budget reform in January, and they said it's going to be open, it's going to be transparent, we're going to make all these changes, and then what? 
What was the bottom line It here? didn't work very well, and uh, I think we got to go back to the drawing board. One of the reforms we were most um, excited about, and it turns out somewhat uh, erroneously, I think, was the notion of what's called consensus revenue forecasting. What they do, and, and New York has a very short time that it, to consider its budget compared to other states. I'm not looking to make excuses for them, but it is a fact that from January to the end of March is a shorter time than most states. And do, so, we, do we, let me just interrupt, yeah. do we expand, do we change the date of probably, the budget? Probably should change it to July 1, um, which would be, which was when almost all other states start their fiscal and year. And the city. And the city. And it would get you past the April dates of when it's a lot of uncertainty mm -hmm. having to do with what tax returns are. So that probably does make sense. So there's a short period. It's even harder for someone coming in, you know, as a new governor to try and turn things around. Um, Part of what we were trying to have as a better process is consensus revenue forecasting, so that around the 1st of March, you basically say, can we possibly shake hands here on what there is to spend? How now, much is way? it? The, the, the leaders, um, both the majority and minority leaders of, the, of uh, each of the two houses of the legislature and the governor. So they could say, what's the envelope in wi within which this budget ought to exist? What, can we agree on the revenue forecast? What's available? They like to call it avails in Albany. So what this reform was supposed to do is, with some time to go, they say, let's shake hands on that amount. And, that's, and if we can't shake hands, let's bring in the state controller to break the deadlock. So that was one of the reforms. They did that. It sounded like it worked. They said there's $575 million more to spend. Uh, well, we would say don't spend it. Put it in a, in a reserve or use it in a, in a fiscally prudent way. But whatever. They agreed on the envelope. Mm -hmm. um, but after that happened, uh, basically the, the, the leader of the state senate held the, took the position for the next three weeks or so that there was actually another four billion dollars to spend um, and he wasn't uh, he wasn't breaking the law in that case I think it's really more of a case of a loophole that he was looking at other available money underspending non-tax or whatever it didn't ha basically we spent the next three weeks arguing oh actually one party saying I think there's four billion more to spend and so it didn't that didn't get resolved until the 10-day window was uh, we were down to that 10-day window and at that point everything just started happening very fast very bad very much five men in a room, as bad as it's been recently, and very disappointing. And they passed the spending bill before they passed the revenue yeah, bill. Yeah, so yeah. no matter how it much was money just, was available, they spent yeah, it. Yeah, it was just a question of you know which uh, bill drafting uh, group could get their bill done first, and how fast would the Xerox machine work? And we had that terrible situation again, where you know the Constitution of the state of New York says that bills should age. For three days, right. and that's a very sensible requirement that uh, legislators, and for that, that matter, maybe even the public, should get a chance to to know there's a pending legislation and, and, and like you folks. to say is this a good idea or not. And of course, there's a you can get around that if there's an emergency, if you know a dam burst and you wanted to start immediately, you could. It makes sense to have an emergency safeguard for that. But the problem is they use that emergency safeguard most of the time for the budget, and they used it again here, where literally uh, the the, the pages were still warm from the printer as members were voting, and of course, no one had any chance to consider it. So nope. these messages of necessity yeah. have been used for the last decade or so. Yeah, longer than that. And they weren't used the last couple of years. The process got slightly better through, I think, pressure from the public uh, in the last couple of years where messages of necessity were not used, where um, there was a functioning conference committee system. In other words, uh, individual legislators had more of a role in the budget, because that's kind of the sad reality of Albany, they, that the, the three or the five men in the room decide everything, and these you know people we send, we vote, we go to the trouble to have elections, a lot of smart legislators, I'm not going to impugn sure. the ability of a sure. lot of the legislators up there, smart people, don't get to behave very much as legislators. They can't even read the if bills. A chair of a, the chair of a um, committee may not uh, be in a position to make any decisions about the spending in that area, and that's not right. So last the last couple of years, it wasn't perfect, but there was a, a process by which uh, legislative committees met and considered the budget. Not this year; they were having these kind of these kind of false meetings where they would meet, but they didn't have any guidance, they didn't have anything, and they would Wait be fakey meetings. So we regressed. We definitely regressed. What other areas did we regress? I'm, I'm just getting depressed over I know, not moving I know. forward, but now you're telling me that we're going backwards. Where else have we gone backwards so then we can look to where we can move forward? Well, I think also the, the property tax rebate program that they enacted has a lot of problems. There's a lot of concern, and it's absolutely correct, that local taxes in New York State are very, very high. And the state has been trying to address that as a political issue and, I guess, as a policy issue as well with this STAR program that's been around for about 
six, seven years now. But it's not a very good program. And there's a million variations on it now. Sometimes it kind of takes the form of school aid, but it doesn't really, it doesn't seem like it has the effect of reducing local taxes. It also treats New York City very badly, treats renters very badly. So there's a lot of problems with that. And we expanded that program quite a bit this year, um, which I know politically is quite popular. But it, from a policy perspective, they really need to take a deep breath and reconsider it. So the steamroller couldn't steamroll. Well, he actually had his own version of a star expansion, which they tweaked. But um, and he got a lot of what he was looking for. So that's a case where I don't agree with what he actually proposed. One of the, the so-called reforms, and you mentioned it too, was the the formula for education yeah. aid. Yeah, they set up the formula, which is a regular rigorous formula, but then they There's ignored some, it. Well, I don't know that they ignored and can't it. Can't they ignore it every year? Well, that, this is a big question, and one of I mean, just to return for the moment uh, to process. Of course, we don't quite know what this budget looks like yet. It was passed. There are bills that were passed, but n nobody can really make any sense so out of those bills. So we're a week and a half out and we still no don't know? There's no budget yet. We're waiting for the division of the budget to do what's called a financial plan, which is a thing that actually tells you in some kind of common sense way, here's the revenues, here's the... And, and, and so you need to get those kinds of details before you can totally know what we're talking about here. I, I, the, the, they set up a very strong formula that made sense from a policy perspective. At the last minute, in order to make, reach an agreement, they threw some extra money into it, and that extra in Nassau. yes, and that extra money made us regress a little bit from what the formulas do. What I'm what I'm dying to see is how far did it just take us back a little bit from a good outcome or a lot? But I think it looks like they did break shares, which all money language for saying they uh, they got off this silly p political deal that they've been operating under for so many years where, where it doesn't matter what the need, right, right, it's all driven by politics, doesn't matter what the kids' needs are. So it looks like there's progress there, but that was um, that was definitely a concern to see money thrown at uh, thrown at the problem. And yes, year two, what will happen? The governor can stake out a strong position saying, I got a new formula. That formula should be allowed to run. But um, legislators who, who change that formula can also say, hey, I, I, I tweaked it last year. I can tweak it again. So really, we can't really evaluate this budget and the governor's performance on this budget until we go through a second year. What did the governor learn? What did the, the, the legislature learn? So the expectations are still high? I think so. I want to keep them high. I mean, you know how strongly my organization feels that Albany needs a severe overhaul, that uh, the way they've been doing business has not been serving uh, the people well, and I don't think it's been serving them well either. Uh, there's just so many, you look at the, the, the issue of judicial pay, not that that's one that right. my organization necessarily weighs in on, but, you know, it's, a, it's, it's part of a horse trading process. And until, uh, you know, do, are they opposed to a judicial pay increase? No, they just see it as a chit in a game that when the right uh, cards can be traded so that it makes sense for them to do a judicial pay raise, it will happen. But until that right set of cards comes along, let the uh, judges uh, languish without a pay increase and in spite of the great respect that everyone has for the chief judge, Judge Kay, mm -hmm. and her recommendations, that's just an example of how they don't deal with the questions in front of them because it's too much of a horse trading kind of culture. So uh, there's a lot to change, um, certainly on the budget. I mean, I think you've got to go back to the drawing board on that process and try and fix it again and then hopefully get more of a momentum for real, you know, continuing the reforms and making them more sweeping. Okay, let's talk about substance, even though we yeah. have talked about right. some. What about the size of the budget itself and its rate of growth, three times the rate of inflation? Yeah. And much of that was the governor's initial executive budget. The right. legislature just added what it usually adds I think that's about. right. It wasn't so much that there was a sort of spending festival after he proposed his uh, his executive budget. It was about a billion dollars added, which of course probably doesn't sound like chump change to most of your listeners, but is not an atypical amount of money, maybe 1% of the budget mm -hmm. to have added. So it's the, the spending growth is very high, but it's not because of what they added during uh, the, the process with the legislature. It's high because the governor started high. And he started high for a reason, which is he had some very uh, major policy goals, mostly having to do with education. Uh, as you know, there's been for many years this lawsuit uh, right. about New York City schools the being CFE campaign the CFE case, and equities. he came in saying he wanted to address that. So he's proposing to add a lot to education spending mm -hmm. and to pair it with 
better accountability measures. So, so that's that, did that's he get great. those better accountability measures? He got some measures? of them, some of them, um, and that's going to be a continuing issue as well. And is this rate of spending sustainable? sustainable? No, and I think what he's got to figure out how to do is to. Uh, to, to make his great priorities happen, but to do it within an envelope that the state can afford. Mm -hmm. um, we're looking at you know, bigger gaps, budget gaps in the next couple of years. What are we looking uh, at? Four billion next year and six billion the year after that, which you could say, you know, there are always gaps. And, but what's a little scary about that is that uh, the economy's doing very well right now. Mm -hmm. uh, the state's got strong uh, tax collections coming in. Uh, real estate downstate remains very strong. So. This is, these are the good times, and it's it's a little nerve wracking to see the gaps of that size when th these are the good times, and it's when the bad times hit, things turn around fast. Sure. So, and you never know when that's going to happen. Let's talk about Medicaid spending. The Medicaid spending didn't decline, but the rate of decline. It's a small increase in Medicaid spending. Right, but the, but the rate was dramatically lowered from 8% a year to 1%. I'm trying yeah, to figure this out he, myself. Well, he basically wanted to reduce the growth uh, rates that, are, that hospitals and nursing homes get. And he had a right. number of other uh, reforms, too, about uh, HMOs and things like that. So he, had a, um, he wanted to reduce the, the growth rates mm -hmm. to the hospitals, which, of course, became the subject of a huge uh, battle royal between himself and, and the hospital. An ad war, multi-million dollar ad yeah. war. What was interesting this time was, I mean, they've done that in the past. He fought back here. With his own ads. With his own ads, which was fascinating to see. You know, I think it became uh, complicated for the public to make sense of it and to really tell who was, you know, what was the truth in all of that. And the truth is that, you know, I would much more agree with the governor that our Medicaid program is really an extremely expensive in New York, and other states manage to do humane programs that take care of their poor people, as we should, um, but for less money. And that uh, it's time for New York's health care system to focus more on, um, on, on how to rein in costs. And in particular, what, I, what we really liked about the governor's budget is this notion that uh, let's recenter the money around people and, mm -hmm. and away from institutions. So I thought he, uh, you know, had the, the better message there. Um, and he got, you know, maybe something like 70 percent of what he proposed is that you know that's not terrible he didn't he didn't he, he got some reductions so you are turning around this metaphorical battleship yeah. in this bathtub i don't like the metaphor because battleships usually don't you can't move them in, bathtub. in a bathtub i don't yeah, think you so, have, no. have to blow up the bathtub yeah. what about the increased child health insurance coverage oh that's great and that's part of what was such a good message in here that uh, let's find ways to to trim spending and yet still reach more people that that need uh, that need coverage, and of course, children being at the top of that list. So I think those are the right priorities. So, the, I mean, there's, there's both good news and bad oh, news yeah. here. What is the bad news that needs to be rectified, simply? Well, I think they've got to bring that spending rate down in the coming years. Um, and uh, that'll be tough because uh, the governor's, this, this big, uh, this year uh, that we're going into now has a huge rate of growth for education, but that's not the end of it. He wants to keep it growing right. over the next few years to really comply with the CFE case. So that means going into each budget, he's got to swallow a big increase there, and so it means you need to reduce more dramatically in other areas in order for the total or raise taxes. budget. And he's been pretty clear that he that doesn't want to do, do that. that. Yeah. So I think that's... That's one of the biggest challenges. And another challenge is this, the state local thing. I mean, you know, we love to talk about right. New York City and right. New York State and the relationship between them. And of course, it's not only New York City, it's all the local governments. And um, it, there is a real mismatch in New York because New York's a state where it's, we have high taxes, everyone knows that. It's mm -hmm. not the state taxes that are high. Those are average compared to the other states. It's the local taxes that are high. And why is that? Partly it's because New York City, because of Medicaid, the mm -hmm. fact that they, counties pay for Medicaid, which doesn't happen elsewhere. It's partly because education costs, particularly in the suburbs around New York City, are very high. It's partly because of Albany doing things like controlling the pension system of everybody and giving a lot of giveaways um, to um, pension systems. Uh, um, and, and retirement and, age. Right. So it's a combination of things, but it, part of why STAR and these property tax rebates are so messed up is it's the state trying to deal with a local problem that it partly helped create and partly didn't. And so also think, that may exacerbate the problem because as you give the jurisdictions and more money, it frees up their money to exactly. spend on that. So, so it seems really, like instead it's of having... a law of unintended consequence, yeah, a law of perverse consequence. Right. So that instead of, uh, instead of having the effect of reducing taxes, it'll often have the effect of increasing them. 
Okay, let's let's look at the city. Very different budget situation. Yeah. It's been real quiet. It's been quiet for two years. The so-called budget dance has it really changed? And if so, with what substantive differences? Well, I think this this particular speaker and this particular mayor have. Uh, really tried to diffuse um, what was happening uh, every year, which was that the mayor would go in with cuts and the council would spend most of its energy restoring those cuts. And I know on, in the case of cultural affairs, they've done some important right. reforms right. that look like steps in the right direction. Um, you know, it was always a funny dance because on the one hand you could say, oh, it was the mayor being unfair and trying to tie the council's hands by uh, forcing them to waste all their precious energy on these, uh, you know, restoring money that really ought to have been there in the first place. You know, there's also another school of thought that said that the council was happy to do it because it was a way they could bring home the bacon for their constituents and say they restored something, even though if you step back and you just look at it from the public's perspective, nothing was any different. It was right. kind of a big waste right. of time. Right. So I think I'm glad to see it lessening because assuming that the city council is up to the task of doing some important legislating, perhaps this will free them to do so. Although it may be that the political seasons being what it is, a lot of them will be worrying about term limits in a couple of years. Absolutely. So. We've got, what, 36 of them, 37 of them looking yeah. for jobs. What's the fiscal outlook for the city? Well, the city, you know, more than the state, um, well, the, both of them really, but it, it's on a, it can be on a real roller coaster because of the nature of its tax base. Unlike most local governments, it has uh, a lot of money that comes in from very economically sensitive taxes, like the income tax and taxes that are based on real estate transactions. So the city, when things are good for the city, the city goes sky high. When things are bad for the city, when the economy takes a downturn, the city can do a 180 so fast and see all its numbers fall apart. Mm -hmm. Right now we're on the upswing and and we have been. We have been for a while. People kept thinking that there was it was the downturn was coming mm -hmm. and that housing was going to soften. It hasn't. Um, and so partly I think the mayor's been uh, uh, lucky to have some some good fiscal times. And also prudent. But uh, in addition, I think he's he has been pretty prudent. What um, the thing that struck me that he's done uh, year after year is. Um, the, the half of the city budget that he likes to call the controllable half has really not grown. Uh, it's grown really below inflation. He's kept costs in check even as he's gone on to improve services mm -hmm. and so found ways to be more productive. The other half of the budget, which uh, people call the uncontrollable half, that part has grown faster. That's pensions, pensions fringe benefits, debt service, that, that, mm -hmm. and, so, and that's worrisome. On the other hand, it hasn't been hard to keep the, bal the budget balanced. Um, there are out-year gaps, but they're not huge. So um, it seems at the moment all pretty manageable. And and it's afforded this kind of fascinating opportunity for the city, which is to think about the future. Let's turn to that, the mayor's 2030 sustainability initiative. Talk about that both in terms of the policy and, and, and the fiscal elements of it. Well, uh, Deputy Mayor Doctoroff has, has led this group to think about the year 2030, 2030 three years from now, uh, and to think what should be the goals, and, and with the promise that perhaps the city could grow from eight million people to nine million right. people if it plays its cards right. right. And it's a great question to be asking, a great endeavor to be undertaking, and of course mayors, I'm sure you you're more of a student of hist city history than I am to study, you know, when have mayors tried this and when has it worked and when has it failed. Right. But this, but this one looks, is, this this is looks promising. This is very, very both promising it's and thoughtful. ambitious. Yeah. And so back in December, the mayor articulated uh, 10 goals for the city mm -hmm. in three areas. And, the, and they're, by and large, they seem like a pretty sensible set of goals. Uh, a lot to applaud there. They have to do with. Uh, better care of infrastructure, better treatment of the environment, uh, worrying about our energy sources, uh, mass transit that functions well, mm -hmm. better parks, more housing. So a really smart list. Uh, what we're all kind of holding our breath now is to see uh, how do you take it to the next step. Right. Once you articulate those 10 wonderful goals. How do you operationalize them and then implement them? Dan Doktoroff is going to be here on the 24th answering those questions. He was here in January when we set it up. Right. Are you optimistic that the core of this can both be funded and maintained? Because the, the, the mayor's term limited in 2009. Does that carry through? Well, that's a good question. Of course, our political system wouldn't want him to be around till 2030, and make, that makes a certain amount of sense, obviously. Um, yeah, I think we need to see first, how does he fit it 
it within the envelope of the budget. I mean, I applaud a lot of the goals that I'm particularly excited about. The focus on infrastructure. Absolutely. It's easy for you know everyone in the in the uh, flurry of the moment to forget that uh, we have a huge system of infrastructure in the city that needs to be maintained. It's easy to put it on the back burner and let it start to fall apart. So unless, of course, the street falls down when the sewers, you know, when you let it go right. for too long. So that's great to see. But how do you afford it? Mm -hmm. I, I you know I would think they're probably going to propose some new revenue sources to be dedicated to. Uh, different, uh, some of this different type of spending, that would be, I think, a logical way to proceed and maybe avoid talking about a tax increase that way. You know, will people accept that? Um, and then do you keep it in place beyond this mayor? Oh, and the other big question, of course, is, I mean, it's, again, going back to the city-state relationship, a lot of these things are not on the, under the direct control of the mayor. mayor. He spoke about the MTA, which, right. of course, is the governor's. Um, but it's, it's good to see him, you know, putting his nose in there because, um, that really is something that needs a regional look, needs a strong sense of cooperation between the mayor and the governor to, to make it work right, and rather than kind of the, it's had a lot of headbutting in that area recently, and Absolutely. it doesn't do anybody any favors. And, and sort of my final question is exactly that. What, what do you see the relationship of the mayor and the governor at this point, and what ought it be, and what is it likely to be? Well, I actually am a bit of a student of these past relationships, having worked for oh. both, I worked for Mayor Koch and Governor Cuomo, and, you know, you watch the different techniques, uh, and any mayor is always critiqued for, you know, well, he should have handled Albany this way, and I, part of me think, thinks there's no good way to handle Albany. His first term, the mayor took a pretty quiet approach, Absolutely. and I, and, and, you know, it was a little low-key. He's, I think, ratcheting up a little. In fact, I was a little surprised how negative he was at certain points yes. in, in reacting to the governor's budget. It seems like the temperature's been turned down a little bit again, and, and I actually think his kind of low-key uh, approach makes a certain amount of sense. They have so many issues to resolve, lower Manhattan, and uh, you know, there's a, such an intertwining on so many of these economic development uh, issues, the Javits Center, the Penn Station. Second Avenue Subway. Second Avenue, to, to, to see them working hand in hand rather than, you know, taking shots at each other would be a great thing. You're optimistic? I am. This I mean, I'm professionally optimistic, so uh, otherwise Are I couldn't do it. you personally optimistic? I am. Good. I am. Good. And, and I want to hear and see if this optimism has been warranted. You're coming back a couple of months? Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, Doug.